Welcome to Delling Pool, a Breitbart.com podcast. Here is the podcast host, James Delling Pool. Welcome to the Delling Pool podcast with me, James Delling Pool, and my very special guest, Neil Monnery, author of a book called Architect of Prosperity. Now, I don't normally plug books on this show, or they're not built around a book, but in this case, I'm going to make an exception, because this is a book about one of my all-time heroes, um, a guy called Sir John Cooperthwaite, who was the financial secretary in Hong Kong, who put Hong Kong on the track to the economic prosperity that it knows today. Is, is that fair, Neil? Is that where we are? Yes, I think he's an absolutely central figure. Not the only one. There were other people who were also uh, heavily involved in getting Hong Kong on the track to prosperity, but he's the central figure that is behind much of the economic policy that drove that success. Yeah, but I think we ought to backtrack here and, and ask, why do we care about what happened in Hong Kong in the 1960s under a British colonial administration. What relevance does this, does this have to the world today? Yes, well that's really the reason I, I started, uh, or I found John Cooperthwaite, which was that I was very struck by the issues that existed in our lack of economic growth in the West and beyond. And just the strains and pressures that puts on society uh, if we don't actually have a good level of economic growth. And as you know, in the UK and the US and much of Europe, uh, economic growth and prosperity has been fairly stagnant for quite a long time. So I started looking around for places where that wasn't the case, where they, in fact they'd had a phenomenal increase in prosperity, and that's how I came across Hong Kong. Two, there? Hong Kong and Singapore, where else is there? Well, oh, was it Korea, the, South there's Korea? There's South Korea, Taiwan, um, obviously, and at different periods, for example, at one point, Britain was in that group when we were the leading uh, creator of prosperity through the Industrial Revolution and so the like. So we're talking about the 19th century. So, so for, for a number of countries, Britain, Holland, France and Germany, it was the 19th century, but the speed with which Hong Kong achieved their growth is the phenomenal thing. And what's more is they not only caught up, they went beyond our level, level of uh, uh, prosperity. So uh, many people argue you, you know, there's, it's fine to catch up, but you can't really go beyond. But whereas Hong Kong is now richer than the UK per capita. I went to um, I went to Hong Kong last year to visit my eldest boy, and he's very happily settled there, and he loves it with his with his gorgeous Hong Kong Chinese wife, who is a babe, and is going to make me some some, some beautiful Eurasian-looking grandchildren. Um, but one of the reasons they're both really happy there is that when you although you work hard, you get to keep so much more of your money. The tax rate, I think the top tax rate is 15%? The top tax rate is 15% and relatively few people pay that. So yeah. there, are, there are both lower levels, but most people pay no tax, no income tax at all. And as you know, it's a free port, so there's no VAT or sales tax either. Yeah. Uh, so yes, you, 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 the level of consumption that the uh, Hong Kong people are able to enjoy relative to their incomes is extremely high. Yeah, exactly. And one thing that's quite surprising is that you, you'd expect somehow the public transport system would be awful because of the lack of government funding, because how, could, how possibly can government um, uh, keep infrastructure up to standards if, if, if the tax revenue isn't, isn't, isn't massive? But it doesn't you, work like that, does it? No. Well, they've they first of all been very careful uh, about what they invest the money in. And that really goes back to the early financial secretaries like John Cooperthwaite being very frugal and being quite careful about where uh, public funding should be used, very much viewing it as money that they've taken from the people. Uh, and so all of the investment projects are very uh, carefully thought through. But also because they are richer uh, than, than, than the UK, for example, even at a lower tax rate, they can spend more uh, on some of these projects as well. Yeah. Um there is an argument, and I, I think we're going to I deal with some of these a bit later on in, in the, the show, which is that, that Hong Kong has so many unique characteristics that it could never work in the West. Um, for example, the Chinese have a, the Hong Kong Chinese particularly have a particular work ethic, that they're entrepreneurial, 
that they can tolerate a lower level of welfare than we would in the pampered West and so on and, uh, and, and so forth. But another, another argument I hear advanced um, to explain away John Cooperthwaite's success in Hong Kong is that, yeah, but the Hong Kong Corporation owns all the, owns so much land and profits by by property deals and so on that it's able to self-finance and so it doesn't really need taxpayer revenue. Uh, yes, well, well, trying to unpick some of those parts. First of all, dealing with the land. I mean, obviously there is a benefit from the government being able to lease or, or sell land, um, but that isn't the main part of their revenues. Uh, and uh, it, it is uh, also a, a sum that could be available to governments elsewhere as well, the, the good use of land. Um, but on this issue that Hong Kong is unique and is a non-replicatable uh, situation, I, I'm not really sure about that. If you go back to the uh, position of much of the UK, Holland, countries like that in the 19th century, they had many of the characteristics that we're talking about during their fast period of growth. They had uh, relatively free capital movement, they had free trade in, in many instances, uh, they allowed entrepreneurs to invest. Um, I, I think it's too easy to say the British couldn't be entrepreneurial. I don't, I don't see that. I see lots of entrepreneurialism around. Uh, I don't think that's the difference um, that would stop the Hong Kong model being applicable. There are obviously differences, but they, they, I don't think at the fundamentals People like Cooperthwaite were really just going back to classical economics and deploying that, yeah. uh, which has been deployed in different situations at different times for, for centuries. And it really is very, very simple what he's saying, isn't it? That what, what, what the economists, the classical economists are telling Cooperthwaite and what he is enacting in Hong Kong, which is, I think in a sentence, don't spend what you haven't got. Yes, well, I think I think he's got certain planks, almost all of which come from people like Adam Smith and and uh, Mill and Ricardo from the classic economics. First of all, it's uh, on the government side, allow the private sector to retain funds if they're reinvesting well, and that he argued various times in his career. If you allow the private sector to invest eff effectively. The, the revenue, the treasury will get that back with interest in due course. So he was very keen on, on uh, high levels of investment in the economy and therefore low taxation. He was extremely keen on the government being careful and cautious in its fiscal po policy. In all but uh, two years uh, up to his, his period of office, up to the end of the 71, uh, Hong Kong ran a budget surplus. Uh, there, were, there, there was no discussion about deficit financing or how, how much is the right amount of national debt. Their target was to have a year's worth of spending in reserve, not to have any deficit. So zero national debt, in fact quite the opposite, and to ensure that government spending was kept below the levels of government uh, revenue. He was then, uh, Hong Kong has always been an open port, but he was very much a free trader. He saw free trade as being part of the market mechanism that enabled uh, people to deploy their assets and resources into the right areas because of the pressures of, of um, international competition. And then domestically, he was very keen on private companies deciding where to put their money. You know, should they invest in plastics? Should they invest in wigs? Manufacturing, what should it be? That was a decision not for the government to make, uh, but rather for people who are risking their own capital. And he was rewarded with those being very good investments over the years. It's almost like hearing you say this, it, it's like hearing somebody <coughs> talk a, an alien language. I mean, you, you almost never hear this conversation in, in the public debate on, on, in government, do you? You never hear politicians saying how important it is to let the productive sector of the economy keep their, keep their profits in order to reinvestment. It's more about how can we best relieve these people of their money through taxes. Yeah, well, I, <clears throat> I think that's right. I think there's a real problem um, in, in trying to uh, move back from a very high level of government spending that we have uh, in many countries in the West to a place where uh, the private sector will be able to deploy its capital more efficiently. Uh, but one of the tricks of economics is even marginal movements matter. So any movement in that direction will, will, will yield some results. One of the things that I think is also important is, which Capitholite was very good at <coughs> uh, talking about, 
was there seems to be confusion between markets and private enterprise, private private companies. Uh, Gubbethwaite was not a, necessarily a fan of private private companies per se, because he thought, like Adam Smith, that private companies would act in their own interests. He was a fan of markets, and markets would enable people to decide through pricing mechanisms where to deploy their capital, where to invest. He was perfectly happy to intervene if there were monopolies or market failures. But for him, the central bit was that the market should be working efficiently, of which obviously the world market and free trade is the biggest example, but it was also true at the local level too. So um, I imagine that if he were running America, <laughs> he'd break up Google and Amazon and, and uh, I mean... I think he would be surprised at the level of government involvement in what are clearly efficient markets and the lack of government involvement in what are clearly monopolies. Right. Uh, so give me, give me some examples. Well, that, 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 I, I mean, in, in his case, he, he would uh, be very heavily involved, for example, on things like water charges. So water in Hong Kong is a scarce commodity. They, they, there's a, a lack of uh, natural uh, ability to, to collect water. And so, it, and, and the scale of investment is such that it doesn't make sense to have that be a, a you know, competitive market. Yeah. Uh, you need you need one public good uh, enterprise doing that. So he was heavily involved in uh, regulating and setting the prices for water provision, even down to the standards of how many how many hours per day would water be available in your in your house. Uh, he has a great uh, quote the way he he he, he felt that. Things like that, water, utilities on, should be priced so that the, the poorest members of society could afford it. He has a great quote where he says, some people find me odd <laughs> that I don't view 24-hour access to water as being an inalienable human right. I, I want everyone to be able to afford to be able to access water for part of the day. Uh, and he doesn't want the government to subsidise it. So he's heavily involved in, in monopolies like that. Um, uh, whereas other things, which were clearly markets, he had very little interest in participating in the regulation of those. It's interesting what you say there, because uh, you're right, uh, you reminded me one of the one of the facets of his personality that comes across in the book, that we're often told by, by the left that conservatives are about special interests and, and looking after the rich and they don't care about the poor. But actually, one of the motivations of, of, um, of Cooper's way was to make sure that public money got to the people who needed it most. He was, I mean, housing, for example. He was very keen to make sure that it's all very well sort of providing welfare for the just about managing. But what about the people below them, below at the bottom of the pile, who tend, tend not to get a look at? Mm. Well, he, he of course felt that if he if he uh, tried to satisfy too many needs, that would require him to raise the tax rate, and if he raised the tax rate, that would m cause growth to drop, which would be to the lo long term detriment of the society as a whole. So he he felt he was quite constrained in his ability to spend public money, in order to get the highest possible growth rate that he could for the people of Hong Kong, in, and in particular the large number of immigrants and poorer people coming into Hong Kong. Given that, he then said, oh well, given we're constrained, how do I, how do I ensure that that money goes to the best possible use? And he was passionately concerned about the poorest and most needy in society uh, being supported by the state, rather than it becoming a subsidy for middle class uh, or richer people. So he, he goes through things like education, where actually he, he's slightly uh, against free education uh, for that very reason. He thinks education is a great thing, but he thinks the provision of free education should be particularly focused in on those who most need it, not necessarily everyone. Uh, he, he had various run-ins over whether or not the government should uh, subsidise car parking. Uh, he was adamantly against the government subsidising car parking, which he saw as very much uh, a benefit to rich people who could afford cars yeah. uh, and therefore at various points he was he was tackled on it by vested interest groups and he continuously refused to allow any government subsidy to go into something like that. How much was he pushing at an open door with his policies? I mean did, did he encounter much resistance to his low tax, uh, low regulation, <coughs> low spending policy? 
Interestingly, I would say he, he encountered considerable resistance uh, in Britain <laughs> from the British government on this. Well, who were socialists. Who were, who were socialists Wilson. through a lot of this period. Uh, and were, uh, and, and the, the correspondence, when you look in the files, uh, is very clear that the Whitehall and the Treasury, the Colonial Office and the government, the politicians, were very much continuously trying to get the Hong Kong government to raise tax rates. Were they? Um, whereas he had quite a lot of support amongst the unofficial members of the Legislative Council who were appointed, uh, but included uh, local Chinese business people and, and the like, um, where they, they were very supportive of a low tax environment and that was used by the financial secretaries in Hong Kong to justify, in part, their low tax environment. Do you remember what the tax rate was in England? at the time? Well, the, the, the tax rate uh, under Attlee uh, came down from the 50% standard rate in the war to 45%, but the top rate was 92.5% of tax. That's really going to encourage the wealth creators, isn't it? Well, and, and more Im uh, as importantly, so not more importantly, as importantly, um, whereas before the war only uh, a minority of households in the UK paid income tax, uh, in the Attlee and so on period, the majority of households actually started paying tax and you could be on half the national income and still be paying income tax. So there was a massive increase to nearly 20 million households uh, of taxpayers, uh, so a vast broadening of the base. Whereas in Hong Kong, it's a very small percentage of the people who actually pay income tax. Most people don't pay it. Yes, I, and I know that in quite a few companies in Hong Kong, they actually pay you 13 months in the year. So <laughs> the 13 months um, pays for pays your, your tax. Pays, pays I your didn't tax. know that. That's oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. They, get, they get paid twice at Christmas. Okay. Um, and I, mean, I, think, I think even Ralph Lauren, where, where, where my, my daughter-in-law right. works, I think they, 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 they do that. It's very, it's very civilized. <laughs> and if you're, That's very good. If, you're, if you're, you're strivers and you're trying to get money together for your, for your family. Yes. It's what you want, isn't it? Well, there's, there's clearly a high level of uh, belief in, in uh, Hong Kong that you have to save some money in order to pay for things like retirement. Uh, and that isn't a state obligation, uh, by and large. You have, to, you have to save some money. So people are trying to optimise in the income that they have. And so that's all very helpful. Yeah. You're listening to the Dellingpole podcast with me, James Dellingpole, and my very special guest, Neil Monnery talking about one of our heroes, Sir John Cooperthwaite, the architect of prosperity in Hong Kong, and a model, I think, that we should be adopting in the West, but we're bloody well not at the moment. Hey folks, I want to tell you about Breitbart News' Second Amendment newsletter, Downrange with A.W.R. Hawkins. It features the top gun stories of the week and guest columnists like Larry Pratt with Gun Owners of America or Marty Daniel with Daniel Defense. Each week also features the review of a firearm or a firearm accessory, something to make the exercise of your Second Amendment more enjoyable. You can subscribe to the newsletter for free at breitbart.com backslash downrange. It'll show up in your inbox every Thursday. This is Delling Pool, a breitbart.com podcast. Here once again is James Delling Pool. Welcome back to the Dellingpole podcast with me, James Dellingpole, and my very special guest, Neil Monnery, author of Architect of Prosperity, a biography of Sir John Cooperthwaite, the, the classical liberal Treasury Secretary who put Hong Kong on the road to wealth and prosperity for all its, all its people. Um, my God, we can learn some lessons, lessons from that. Just going back a bit, who is this bloke? Who was this bloke? John Cooperthwaite. Where did he come from? Well, he he was born in Edinburgh uh, in the uh, beginning Scott. of the so, Scott. So that, Scott, that like many Scott. many of the colonial office, uh, he was a Scott. Um, he was yeah born in the early part of the last century to a, a family which had been involved in uh, government tax collecting and surveyors and things like that. So a middle middle class family, um, and he then went to public school and. Uh, onwards from that to study classics at St Andrews, which he did for four years, uh, got a first. And then he went to Cambridge to study classics again for another two years, uh, did, did a bachelor's degree twice, going got a first. Uh, 
And I think he was probably set on uh, a path to become a professor of classics or maybe a teacher at a leading public school. But then the war intervened and he got called up and uh, briefly served in the army. Uh, didn't, didn't see active service, uh, but then applied to join the colonial office. Uh, he, and in particular, a thing called the Hong Kong Cadets, which was an elite group uh, of administrators in Hong Kong. Uh, he fortunately um, hadn't arrived in Hong Kong by the time of the Japanese invasion, and so he wasn't. In, in, he would have been interned. The Japs did terrible things to Hong Kong, didn't they? They, 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 they did, yes. And uh, he, he would have been interned, and who knows what would have happened then. But um, fortunately, he was instead diverted to Sierra Leone, where he worked for a few years before returning to London to join the thing called the Hong Kong Planning Unit, which was planning how Britain would uh, recover. Uh, civil administration in Hong Kong post the war. So he worked in that and then in 1945 arrived in Hong Kong when it was liberated and started that journey from there on. So very much a, a classical Scottish, slightly academic background. Okay, he, but he was familiar, he was versed in the classical economists and, and he believed in them. Yes, he, he did a very interesting thing. So uh, when he was uh, in the early parts of the Second World War, he actually went off for a year back to St Andrews and studied economics and took an economics degree in a, in a one-year accelerated uh, class under a professor called John, uh, uh, James uh, Nisbet, who was a great free trader and a great uh, laissez proponent of laissez-faire. And at that point, uh, Cooperthwaite studied Smith, Adam Smith and Ricardo and Mill and all the great classical economists. Um, and you can see in his talks and his measures throughout the rest of his life him relying on that intellectual foundation of the classical economists and really using that as his way of trying to work out what would be the optimal economic policies to drive growth uh, in Hong Kong. You studied economics at, at Cambridge. At Oxford. Uh, uh, Oxford, yeah. sorry. Um, and um, was it still being taught then, the sort of the classical economics, or, or had it already been hijacked by the by the kind of it, the Keynesians? Yes, it had, it had gone, interestingly. Uh, so bizarrely, I, I uh, had a tutor who actually, uh, I note in the, in the book, Walter Elters, who in fact was a great uh, studier of classical economics, but we didn't cover it uh, when I was there. We were in the Keynesian versus monetarist debate uh, at that time, and that was the big thing and the emergence of rational expectations and increasingly the use of maths uh, in economics uh, whereas if you go back to Cooperthwaite's time and his class it was much less mathematical and much more around policy and psychology and how people behave. Well psychology is surely really quite important where markets are concerned, fear and greed and, and self-interest and... Indeed yes and, and it was that that he drew on and the, the work of Keynes had just come out, as you remember, in 1936. It, it, it took a while for the academics even to understand quite what was being said by Keynes and how to, uh, how to make it more than just spent deficit financing. Can you briefly give me your, your, tell me where I should stand on Keynes? Because whenever I sort of, law, as you know, I read English, not, not economics, but whenever I go into one about how bloody awful Keynes was, what a blight he's been on world economies ever since. People say, no, actually, he was a really good economist and, and you realise he made so much money as an investor, and I know, I know all that. But surely, surely to goodness, Keynes has been a, a negative force on, on most global economies with, with his idea about deficit spending and so on. Isn't, isn't he dangerous? I'm probably not a good enough economist to be the right person to ask for that, but I, I, my, I think my... my my comments would be that he was obviously a, a, of his time in that he thought he was particularly dealing with the Great Recession, the Great Depression, and what he called a lack of demand. And therefore, if you read him tightly, I think what he would say is, if you're sure there's a lack of demand, you can stimulate it by government spending. But of course, it's, a, it's an interesting question as to where, when is there a lack of demand. I, I don't think anyone would argue that in most periods there is a lack of demand it would only be in very special cases so part of his ideas have been uh, simplified by politicians into saying well we should spend government money at all times and deficit finance yes. at all times that isn't I think what Keynes said he said only in 
these unique occasions where the market has ceased to function uh, should and, and the demand is not present. Many economists don't believe such occasions occur. Well, the, well, um, well, you say many. I'm not sure that's true. Well, that's, that's not. You're right, actually. No. Some economists, Some economists don't believe are such persuasion. Might yes. argue that. I mean, and Mises and Hayek would surely yeah, argue that it, the, that it should be the market should clear. And, and yeah. Cooperthwaite too. I noticed that there was there were periods in the book, uh, periods in, during his tenure as Treasury Secretary, where the economy goes through a few bumps. Like yes. The, the, the banking crisis. Yes, yes. Uh, Hong Kong gets hit hard by the Wilson's decision to devalue the, the pound. The devaluation, And, and yeah. the Hong Kong dollar, a lot of their holdings are in, in, in sterling. Yeah. Um, so it gets a few bumps. And at these, these crisis points, this is when the voice is saying, you're wrong, we must intervene. Yes. And, and Cooperthwaite sticks to his guns because he, does. he believes in markets self-correcting. That's right. So his, uh, in a way, his, gr his great contribution is by not doing anything. Uh, so he, he refuses to listen to the siren calls of, you know, we must do something immediately. He says, no, the market will correct. And, and he also believes that anything he, that he might do would almost certainly be too late, too little, too, you know, not quite right. Uh, and therefore, he talks about the clumsy hands of the bureaucrat uh, fiddling in the in the delicate mechanism of free markets, and and is very against that. So yes, he he uh, I think would have preferred, or uh, in each of these cases where there's something that knocks them off course, for the market to correct. And in all cases, it did. So he was sort of proved right. Uh, <laughs> but each time it came to a new crisis, there were the same calls of we must intervene. But look, I, I heard of John Cooperthwaite first, I think, through Martin G Durkin, who's been a previous guest on this podcast. I don't really know Martin. He's a, he's a filmmaker, former revolutionary Marxist, who Sorry. saw the light, a working class um, from the north somewhere. Um, and uh, he is very, very, very much a believer in, in, in free markets. He made Brexit the movie, among other things. And... Uh, so he mentioned Cooperthwaite. I'm trying to think who else knows about him. He's, he's kind of a cultish thing among those of us Absolutely. who know. Yeah. Now, extend that into my acquaintance, my conservative acquaintance. When I talk about people like Cooperthwaite, when I talk about Mises and Hayek, I'm looked on like this kind of weird, cranky figure, like I'm sort of... I'm spouting this mumbo jumbo, which is the obsession of a few weirdos, mm. but it is not part of the mainstream. Well, I, I think on all those points, I, I, I have had the same uh, set of experiences. Um, the reason I started looking at, at this issue about the lack of growth maybe four or so years ago, and I found Hong Kong as an exemplar of, of, of success. And then it took me a while to find out, well, there was this person who kept being mentioned as being central to the story, who I had never heard of. Um, and, and then as I, as I managed to research further and further, I thought, well, this guy actually is very much the central figure, the primary architect of the uh, success of Hong Kong. And yet so few people know about him. Uh, I was really surprised. He, he, of course, never wanted to write an autobiography or be the key part of the story. But I think that's a pity in a way because he has so much to contribute. And so I, I, I think it's great. To, uh, it was, it's been fascinating to learn about him and see how central his role is and to contrast it with how little known he is and how much he's in the obscure edges. On the issue of people not understanding it, I think he's very interesting because Hayek and uh, Mises and so on are academics. Uh, Kibberthwaite did this in a large economy and it enriched and improved the lives of millions of people. So this is not some academic textbook. This is people's lives that have been affected by his philosophy and his policies. And we should judge, I mean, whether you're for or against it, we should judge it on the way in which it affected those people. Yeah, I was reading on the way down the bit in the book, on the, on the way down to this bloody annoying hotel with the really shit piano music playing in the background, <laughs> which is just driving me up the wall. Do you know, it's not even a pianist listener. It is a, a self-playing piano, which I asked them to turn off and they wouldn't for some reason. I suppose they think it adds atmosphere, it doesn't. And it's got louder, I think, during the interview. It has. Bust. It's a bit distracting. So sorry about that. So I, I hope you can 
Because, well, because now, now I've drawn your attention to it. <laughs> yeah, you're here at all. You're going to hear the crap piano and you're not going to hear the story of John Cooperthwaite. Um, what were we saying? <laughs> <laughs> on the right way oh, down, yeah, on you the were way reading. Down, the on summer. the way down, that's right, on the way down. Um, you describe a moment where Cooperthwaite remarks on the fact that even though um, they've got the tax rate low, yet remarkably the amount that they take in tax revenue mm. is increasing mm. every year as the economy grows. I mean, for some of us it's like, duh, <laughs> but but when when Arthur Laffer made a yeah. similar point, yeah. he was hailed as a kind of visionary yeah. genius. And it seems to me that there was lots of em- empirical evidence to show that, yeah, you keep, keep taxes low, mm. people will pay them, and they'll be able to generate money to pay more taxes in the future yeah which is the antithesis of current policy in most in most western nations yes i th- I, I think Cooperthwaite was a great believer in low in low uh, but uh, highly collected if you like taxes so uh, he he uh, he's a civil servant after all so he certainly would not have wanted anyone to try and weasel out of paying their taxes but the quid pro quo was that they were at low levels and so they, they put a lot of effort into uh, enforcement of uh, tax collection but in the environment of lo- low taxation and, and that was really because he believed that by not over collecting uh, that money would be invested would be saved and then would be invested and it would therefore drive the growth uh, through investment of the Hong Kong, Hong Kong economy. Is it your experience when talking about these issues, it certainly is mine, take the Laffer Curve. Yeah. Um, you, if you Google Laffer Curve, probably the, um, the responses will be dominated, but the, thing, the pages that will come up will be dominated by lefties Keynesians explaining why the Laffer curve doesn't actually work. It isn't actually, isn't actually true. I, I haven't done that, but, but I'm, I'm sure. I, mean, I, I think the great thing with Cooper is he was an empiricist. He, he, he was very pragmatic. If, if he had started down this road and actually the taxes hadn't come in, or if he had found that markets didn't produce better outcomes, he would have changed his mind. Yeah. Uh, he, he was a British civil servant trying to raise the living standards in Hong Kong. He was not a, a theoretical economist yeah. uh, trying to come up with a mathematical paradigm. Uh, so he was at the end of the day a pragmatist and one who believed in going very much out and about in Hong Kong, seeing what the effect of his policies was and trying to gauge whether or not it would work. You, you may have been referring, for example, to the Chinese tobacco tax. Um, so so he, he'd gone out and he'd found out that actually there were a number of ways in which you uh, could avoid the Chinese uh, tobacco tax. So he shifted it, lowered the tax rate and tax take went up. Um, but he, he would Imagine. spend a lot of time wandering around um, and actually, one of the one of the stories I heard was that he was very annoyed when the budget speech started to become televised because up until that point he'd been able to go incognito all around Hong Kong and collect uh, data that he would sort of uh, use in in thinking through his policies from seeing how people were acting on the ground. And after he started being televised and his picture being on the on, on the TV, his ability to do that himself was uh, was reduced. So so yeah, no, I think he was he was not a theoretician. If he'd found a different tax rate would have been better, he would have been happy to to go for that. He he came to his view that a low tax rate was right because he thought that was the one that would give him the highest economic growth. The the other famous thing about Cooperthwaite we haven't mentioned yet is is that he was very reluctant to keep records of, of um, and, and metrics and things like that so mm. to see how the, the economy was doing because yes. he felt that if you knew what was happening yes he 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 uh, he fought very hard and uh, to, to avoid the collection of things like GDP data <laughs> which everyone nowadays obviously considers an absolutely basic piece of information uh, but uh, if you read through the files, you can see how active he was in <laughs> preventing some poor academic who he had asked to write a report on it in trying to, and, and then he blamed uh, for, the, I think it took nine years for his report to come out. And Cooperthwaite was the key person behind the scenes making problems in this report coming out. His, his logic was very clear, which was that he thought that if you started collecting GDP data and the like, uh, that would be used to justify government intervention in the economy. Uh, 
And looking back, Diana Kaur's written a very interesting book on the history of GDP, and it talks about why GDP numbers were ever formed in the first place. And it was by Keynes and Roosevelt in the New Deal in order to partly justify the interventions in the economy. Because you had this data, you could work on it. So Cooperthwaite was in many ways right that if you, in his aversion to it, because he, uh, he didn't want the second order effect of people wanting to intervene. So he basically banned the collection by the economics department of, uh, of GDP data until he left in 71. Uh, you're listening to the Delling Poor podcast with me, James Delling Poor, and my very special guest, Neil Monnery, author of Architect of Prosperity, about Sir John Cooperthwaite, the classical liberal hero of Hong Kong. Sunny Johnson brings her cutting edge conservative commentary to Sirius XM Patriot every week on Sunny's Corner. I didn't learn conservatism from Rush Limbaugh, Sean Hannity, or Mark Levin. No conservative showed up in my school, my neighborhood, or anywhere in my intellectual orbit. I got all my conservatives from my unknowing but conservative principle practicing family and hip hop. Sunny's Corner, every Saturday at noon east on Breitbart News Saturday. Sirius XM Patriot 125. This is Delling Pool, a Breitbart.com podcast. Here once again is James Delling Pool. Welcome back to the Delling Pool podcast with me, James Delling Pool, and my very special guest, Neil Monnery, author of Architect of Prosperity about Sir John Cooperthwaite. Um, Neil, you're not just some random bloke who's just gone and written this biography. You, you actually have had success at your, of yourself, at your own, in, in the business world, haven't you? Uh, well, I, I've been in business for a long time, yeah, 30 years uh, as a consultant and as a business person, yeah. And you've actually, you've actually walked the walk, you, you, you turned around W.H. Smith. Well, I didn't, but a team of, uh, I was one of a team that uh, turned around W.H. Smith's uh, over the last few years. I mean, uh, I think part of the reason I was very interested in Cooperthwaite uh, was because of my working life has been in the commercial sector, I could sort of see some of the resonance uh, connecting the economics and the way in which businesses actually work. Oh, really? Tell me, tell me about that. Because, uh, yeah. well, uh, well, I, I think uh, one of one of the things that more successful companies do is they are very careful about where they invest their cash and their capital. Uh, and the the, the Cooperthwaite uh, Adam Smith type view that private enterprises work out where to put their capital and if they do that well they do well I think I think is a very powerful measure in the business world uh, the allocation of capital is a critical decision that all CEOs face uh, and the better they can be at it uh, I think the more successful their companies will will be so you mean for example in the case of W. H. Smith you came in and saw that there were certain areas that weren't working weren't generating revenue or whatever weren't profitable and therefore you sort of diversified into other areas which are more profitable is that is that it yeah well again not uh, the team of the the team i was yeah. the strategy director yeah. uh, there so um what we did uh, very early on was try and work out yes which which were the parts of the business uh, that we could earn high returns on going forward for the long term and which were the parts of the business that were more difficult so to give you a practical example of that uh, at that time, which is now more than 10 years ago, um, DVDs were growing very quickly. But as we modelled it, we, we didn't think over the long term selling DVDs in a high street location would be very profitable. Uh, so even though the market was growing at 20%, we de-emphasised the investment in that part and increased the investment, for example, in, in travel stores, right. in stations and airports. And subsequently, a number of people who perhaps didn't make that move, like Woolworths, uh, uh, didn't do so well because they had continued to pour capital into a bad, uh, in, well, into a low return area. That's interesting because because I I, I mean I, I remember the days of Tower Records. You went to yes, Piccadilly, yeah, you went yeah. into Tower Records, yes, and it was yeah. an experience, and it was where you got your CDs yeah. and stuff. And of course, Tower Records is now yeah no longer with us. And 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 that's another key theme, which is the world moves on. And Cooperthwaite was very clear that. Uh, situations will change and it wasn't really the job of the government to try and work out uh, which industries were on the up and which were on the down. So he had 
various points through his career is being uh, encouraged to uh, support a particular industry, the enamelware industry or the wig industry, wig manufacturing industry or whatever. And he says, well, you know, if they, if, if they are good industries, people will invest in them. And if they're not good industries, they will decline. Uh, and, and, and he was perfectly comfortable with that life's uh, stage argument of industry. Uh, rather than the government intervening, trying to prop up uh, less well-performing industries or indeed management propping up less well-performing parts of the business. So I think, I, I wouldn't overdraw it, but there, there is a parallel between what happens in a company and what happens in economic policy too. Is it not the case that the problem that so many Conservative politicians have in trying to defend free markets or capitalism, as they sometimes mistakenly call it, mm. um, is, is that um, it's the creative destruction element, it's, 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 yeah. it's, it's, the, it's the cruelty which, uh, or rather the, the suffering which comes from companies failing. Yes. And they feel that they ought to do something about it. Yes. I, I think that ov obviously if you're a politician that's, that is one of the most difficult elements yeah. to, be, to be popular. But, but what in, do you say to those politicians? Well, I, 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 I think uh, we need to go back to getting greater public support uh, that it's critical to have a higher level of economic growth. And if we want a higher level of economic growth, we need to accept some uh, of the elements that get you there. So uh, how, how do you... I mean, it's all very well for us uh, as, as, as um, starry-eyed acolytes of, <laughs> of Cooper's Great and so on. Um, we know we know that free markets work, but how do you, if you're a politician and you're worried about votes and stuff, and you're worried about Jeremy Corbyn with his mm. promises of jam today and jam tomorrow, um, how do you counter that narrative? Well, I, I, I mean, again, I think you need to. Uh, it's very, it's very difficult. There's obviously a great attraction to uh, some of the non-market uh, answers because they appear to give. A big benefit now at no future cost. Yeah. I, I think they need to be clearer about why there is a long-term cost in the government propping up un, unprofitable, unsuccessful industries and the like. Uh, that doesn't mean, I think, being uncaring about how transitions occur. I think one of the great benefits of being a wealthy society is that we can cushion and improve the way in which uh, changes occur. But to try and stop the change, uh, or to try and have too high a level of tax as well, and therefore deplete the level of investment that occurs, is likely to lead to a lower growth. I think the, the, the more that it's possible to get that narrative to be accepted, the, the stronger it be. I'd, I'd, I would re-underline a point you just made around markets are not, pri or private enterprise is not, and capitalism is not, uh, quite the same thing as markets. Markets are the critical element. Yes. Um, I don't think Cooperthwaite had any interest in supporting a privately owned monopoly or a private company that wished to uh, make use of a, a market failure. He would be very happy to regulate those. Uh, so I think a much clearer distinction between compet the, the power of competitive markets and that being slightly different from private enterprise or private ownership. Um, obviously, uh, you know, you can have private monopolies as well. Yeah, I mean, I think Hong Kong was very lucky, wasn't it, to have that? It was, it was the tail end of this uh, a British administrative class, which began, I suppose, in the early days of the empire, and people went to the went to the the public schools, and then they then they went out to run sort of a uh, hundred million square miles of Sudan or whatever uh, as, as clone administrators with this with this sense of, of duty above mm -hmm. all. They wanted to do the right thing, they were incorruptible and, and, and the, the Hong Kong civil service was, was, was part of that, wasn't it? Yeah, I don't, I'm, I'm, I, I'm sure that there was a spread of performance, yes. <laughs> if you like, amongst the where the British civil service and colonial office worked. Um, I, and the one I know is best from this research is Hong Kong, where by and large I think the Hong Kong uh, civil ser the British civil servants working in Hong Kong, worked very much in the interests of the Hong Kong people, were pretty pretty much un incorruptible, 
uh, and uh, very clear about what they were they were trying to do. I'm sure there are other examples where they, that you know that wasn't the case. But in the case of Cooperthwaite and his uh, predecessors and successors, I, I think they were extremely careful in thinking through the interests of Hong Kong, and that often put them uh, at um, at odds with the interests of Whitehall, the colonial office in London, and the, and the government in London. And when that happened, they would almost always go on the side of the Hong Kong people. Uh, I suppose what I suppose what I'm getting at here is is sort of um, Ubi Sunt um, th- that that you don't get people of the calibre of of Cooper's yeah. either in in certainly not in the, not in the civil service in Britain now. I mean they've been been horribly politicised under the appalling creature Jeremy Haywood, and then <laughs> you've got you, yeah I mean, he's just like the worst. And but but then you look at our political class. I mean, even mm. even politicians I admire, even politicians I conservatives I admire. There's a, there's only actually one I can think of um, who who talks the economic talk and understands it, and that's Jacob Rees-Mogg. Oh, um, I I mean I uh, I think I got a couple of thoughts off from the Hong Kong side. One of which is um, interestingly, uh, whereas Hong Kong. If you take the post-war period, Hong Kong had a GDP per capita, which was about 30% of that of the UK. Yeah. By 1997, when there was the handover, uh, the Hong Kong uh, GDP per capita was about the same as the UK. Interestingly, it has carried on growing. So actually now the GDP per capita is 140% of ours here in the UK, really? even post the period you're discussing. So I think there is something about the underlying institutional structure in Hong Kong, who knows how long that will last and so on, but there's, there, there's no reason to believe that all stopped when the British civil servants dis, dis, disengaged, if you like. I do also think it's very interesting to note that at the same time that the British civil service in the 50s and 60s was implementing one set of policies in the UK, a different group of British civil servants was implementing a very different set of policies in Hong Kong. And that, I think, is a very intriguing uh, question as to you know, how, how do the similar group of people come to very different views as to what but it is that Neil, they should do? Neil, do you not doing? think that we are both freaks, basically? <laughs> I mean, I mean you, look, you, you go to dinner parties, I go to dinner parties, you move in financial circles and, and business circles. Business, it seems to me, has been so, become so kind of corporate, uh, what's, the, what's the word, um, sort of compliance and... and um, uh, Diversity policy and all these all these kind of politically correct measures, which have nothing to do with actually the business of doing business. How do how do how do we get our our free market views out in a world which seems to have moved against free markets? Well, I I, I would come back to that. Really, I think it, it, one has to be clear that business works for the benefit of society and not the other way around, and that it's therefore for the politicians to set the parameters. I do think it's a pity that politicians have allowed corporatism to uh, become more prevalent and the lobbying of businesses uh, to play a heavier role where they should be instead relying more heavily on free markets uh, yeah. to do that. I, I, I don't know how practical it is to do that. I, I mean, at the moment, my, my uh, I, and I also fully accept that Hong Kong was a, was a specific time and place. But there are other examples. One, one of the ones I'm intrigued to study further myself is Switzerland, where I think they've combined very high levels of local democracy with quite careful spending and quite uh, careful definition of the role of the central and local governments in, 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 um, in, the, in the economy. Uh, I, I don't know enough about it yet, but I, I think there could be other exemplars around the world if we look for them. Uh, and it's, I hope, by telling narratives and stories like the book uh, on Hong Kong that people will see, well, maybe there is another way, or at least maybe I can take some elements of it. Uh, there seems to be a lot in. of um, local autonomy in Switzerland. I mean, mm. towns can, yeah. cities can set their own tax rates and stuff. So if you exactly. get to Zouk, yeah. Yeah. you get yeah. virtually no tax, whereas I think um, Bern is quite, is quite high tax, but it's quite a nice place to live. And there is, there's an emerging theme in um, emerging area of study in economics called public economics, I don't know if you've come across no. it, which, which basically says, well, maybe the political class, uh, just, as in, just as in normal economics, you try and optimise the outcome for you as an individual or you as a company, 
maybe the politicians are trying to optimise the outcome for getting re-elected. And that may lead you to a different set of outcomes for economic policy than it would do if you were actually disinterested politically, like Cooperthwaite was, but actively interested in trying to increase the uh, prosperity of Hong Kong. But that is what you say is absolutely. You, you look at you look at um, George Osborne's economic record, for example. That is entire and the, the, the entire Cameron administration behaved as if our goal is to stay in power regardless. It wasn't about about doing the right and brave. And, that, and that's what this uh, this area of economics, public economics, is trying to point to, which is you you can very easily have a divergence between what is in the interests of people who want to get re-elected versus what is in the interests of the long-term growth of a, of a country. One of the great strengths, I think, of, of, of Cooperthwaite was that he viewed future generations, by the way, who are obviously not voters yeah. for the cur in the current election or indeed for the next several, as equally worthy of, their, of the support of the government through fast economic growth as the current generation. So he was very indifferent as to whether the current uh, people of aged 18 upwards were the people who got the reward or if it was future generations. That's a very different set of incentives than somebody who needs to get elected by the current uh, voter population. Yes, I, I, I've, written, I've just written a piece for the, um, for the Spectator in which I've cited your book and cited Cooperthwaite and I um, recall in it a conversation I had with a senior, a senior Tory minister and um, he said to me, sort of fondly and sort of mildly patronisingly <laughs> and affectionately, um, I don't think I'm as much of an Austrian as you are. And, and the implication in his tone was that somehow economics, free market economics, was, a, was something for wonks and, and, and eccentrics, but not really the business of politicians for whom politics is the art of the possible. And I wonder... I don't. Mm. Know, you don't. You, you can be more politic than I am, but I wonder whether there was anything we can do to stop Jeremy Corbyn becoming prime minister in a world where nobody in the Conservative Party, pretty much, is prepared to speak up for the one area which which Conservatives are always going to succeed over over Socialists, and that is in economics. They're, they're mm. embarrassed by economics. Yes, I, I think that's a great pity. I mean, you know, Cooperthwaite was a classicist, uh, was, was uh, you know, a civil servant, was a very cultured man. Uh, he, he enjoyed reading French literature of the 18th century. By all accounts, everyone who I've met who has talked to him in his life uh, or, or been affected by him uh, is convinced he was a very kind man. He, he learnt about his economics and he did his economic policy for the benefit of society. It was um, not in any sense for his own benefit or, or, as we said earlier, for doctrinaire reasons. He thought that by being up to speed with classical economics, by being uh, careful about working out where it works and where it doesn't work and so on, that he would have a huge impact on the lives of millions of people. And he did. I mean, he had a... So, so if a politician isn't interested <laughs> in economics, yeah. it, it seems to me that's a great pity because economics has been a, a driver, uh, or good economics, has been a driver of uh, the increase in living standards that we have enjoyed up to today. I've just had a brilliant idea. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to give you my brilliant idea now while we're recording. Okay, go for it. Um, you're obviously not going to get this book out to schools um, in, it, in its current state. I mean, kids aren't... I have to say, <laughs> it is... Uh, this is as bedtime reading goes. Let me just, just give you some examples of, um, of, 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 the, of the titles, of, of the chapter sub, subheadings. The Weak Banking Bill of 1947. Well, you don't think that's a winner um, in the ex -post young people today? Ex-post-rationalisation <laughs> and effect... Cooperthwaite you said you found it interesting. the opposition to tax reform. No, what I'm saying is this book is way more interesting than it has any right to be with titles like that. You, I mean, you've got chapters on the 1967 budget, the 1968 budget. I love this book, but my God, it, 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 it ought to be so dry and dull, and it's not. But I think you need to find a way of selling this to a bigger audience than obsessives like me. And one way you could do it 
I mean, it costs money, but I bet there'll be people in Hong Kong who would fund this. I mean, there, there's quite a big, rich, rich Hong Kong financier, entrepreneur fan club for. Kipling. Well, well, I, 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 I've been very lucky in talking to people in Hong Kong, uh, both at the civil service level and the research departments there, but also Cooperthwaite is seen by a number of the. Uh, business people in Hong Kong, the great families that have built textile businesses and the like, as being a, a central figure um, for whom they have a great deal of admiration. Uh, and they obviously know much more than I do in terms of his, his practical impact on their businesses. Um, and they certainly, many of them would argue Hong Kong wouldn't be nowhere near the place it is today yeah. if he hadn't been the person. And I do remember perhaps the most dramatic time for me is when he first became financial secretary in 1961 and his predecessor had questioned whether laissez-faire should continue uh, had actually sort of suggested that there should be a third way um, and um, and and the legislative council and the uh, unofficials were very taken with this question and were increasingly convinced that actually there, there probably should be a third way instead of all this more harsh laissez-faire stuff yeah. And it took Cooper to wait a year before he marshaled all the troops, but then he came down firmly on the side of, we will let the markets work. Uh, and that was a brave decision. That, that to me, is a pivotal decision uh, where a politician-civil servant changed the future of a country, a territory, uh, where it would, could have gone one way or another. Yeah. So, we need to get the message out there. The way to do it is you need to turn this into a graphic novel. Breitbart had a tremendous success with a book called Clinton Cash, All right. which was a. The, yeah, my, I can't was, draw. It came in two versions. It came, it came in came in the kind of the book version. Yeah. But then they turned it into a graphic novel, which I read, and and it it just shows how incredibly corrupt the Clintons are, and I'm I'm sure it did its bit towards <clears throat> winning the election for 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 Trump because Hillary. You couldn't read that book and not not think that Hillary was the most crooked presidential character in the history of the of the of presidential attempts. Um, but this would work as a graphic novel. But you but but they're very expensive to produce. Yeah. Um, because because I mean they're almost a lost leader. So what you'd need to do is to get a Hong Kong businessman to, to pay for your graphic novel. I mean, I'm serious. Yeah. And yeah. get it out to schools. Well, I, I, I think, you know, obviously I, I wrote it because I was intrigued by the story and uh, it appealed to uh, my, my thinking that there must be some more that economics and economic policy makers could contribute to the current debate. Um, and and Cooperthwaite's story, I think, is one that we can reflect on and take, take parts of it. I think if it could be, it could be broadened, I mean... I, think, I, I, I'm not, I, don't, I don't think I know how to do a graphic novel, novel but yeah, obviously... I'm not asking you to draw <laughs> no, the pictures, no, no. Neil. But, um, but I, I... I know you're multi-talented. But, yeah, but, not, yeah, I can't do that. Uh, no, but you, but, get, but like, I think, you, were, you were in the, the station... I mean, the... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> not sure that either. <laughs> but, yeah, you used, you used but, to sell books, for goodness sake. Yeah. Right. Uh, whereas I, I think for me, the next step I, I'm probably going to take is to look at other examples of where economic growth have, has done very well. Yeah. I, I think many of Rwanda. them, <laughs> many of them have very close similarities to the story that we've been talking about uh, in Hong Kong. Um, and I also want to look at where economic growth uh, in prosperity, so GDP per capita, I'm talking about primarily, uh, has not done so well. Places like Argentina, which was one of the richest countries in the Wales, world, Scotland, <laughs> Northern Ireland, and 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 I I agree. It's it, you know. Is it likely to swing the public debate <laughs> anytime soon? No. Yeah, uh, but look, probably somebody's not. But we got should, to we've all got to do our bit. We all do bit. our bit. Exactly. You write the books, yeah. I do yeah. the podcast, yeah. get somebody because else to the I think, I, I think it's too easy to, or, 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 or what I think comes through very clearly in this story is uh, that actually to have spent more money on bad things uh, early on in this period would have deprived future generations of prosperity. And actually, bad allocation of resources by government, um, inappropriate industrial planning, uh, picking winners that aren't really winners, but are actually uh, trying to just get a particular interest group to, to have something, uh, taxing and not then using the money very effectively, is not a no-cost answer. 
sure you sure you transfer some money to the current generation or the current set of voters, but you Cooperthwaite's argument, and, uh, and I would agree with that, is you do that at the cost of the prosperity of future generations, and not just one or two, but forever. It, it's it's a compounding cost. Therefore, you have to be extremely careful about the allocation of resource, um, uh, and, and I think that's where politicians aren't doing a very good job. So, what, yeah, one can do one's bit. Uh, yeah, uh, we'll do we'll, we'll 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 do our bit. Well, thank you very much. Now, you're listening to the Dellingpole podcast with me, James Dellingpole, and my very special guest, Neil Monnery. Talking about Sir John Cooperthwaite, uh, you, you you should buy his book, and you should definitely know more. But I, I look. I think somebody should make a movie of John Cusack's wage. I mean, can you imagine Someone mentioned anyone that in Hollywood, Hollywood buying it? No, because they're all no. bloody lefties. But <laughs> it ought to be done. Thank you very much, Neil. My pleasure. Bye.